that this weekend is really going to be a powerful, not only atmosphere shift, but it's going to be a powerful breakthrough. And I believe that many of us are going to really break through to a new spiritual dimension. Who feels like this is a season where God wants to take you into another dimension? And I want you to know that it's not just for you. Tell your neighbor, it's not just for you. But it's for your family. It's for your friends. It's for people that maybe at one time were locked in with God but they've lost their connection. And I want to say something, that this is the weekend where many of them are going to get their connection back. Come on, somebody. You're going to get that connection back. So on Saturday, everybody say Saturday. It it begins at 9 a.m. We're going to open up the doors for prayer. And at 9 a.m., we want you to come in and start praying. And then at 10, I'm going to minister. And then after me, uh, Pastor Matthew Thompson will be ministering. And and, and I encourage you to prepare your heart to fast. You know, I spent the day with him today. He is excited. He believes that God has given him a word, a powerful word for people. And the anointing is going to be strong this weekend. So before you even think about Sunday, think about Saturday. I, I believe that this weekend should be a weekend of consecration. Consecration is like a week of separation where you, you just separate yourself. Someone says separate yourself. You know, you, you change the way you eat. Some might want to fast. You turn off that tube. You turn off that Facebook, that Instagram. You, you take time to be able to hear from God. You just cleanse yourself and get ready. So it's going to be a powerful weekend. Tonight, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 3. And... Uh, This is going to be an encouraging word tonight. Whether you find yourself, wherever you find yourself, honestly. But I think that either way, this word is going to speak tonight. Second Kings chapter 3. And I want you to go with me to verse 9. And I just want to read here in verse 9. When everybody has it, say, I got it. Okay. It says, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days. Look at this. And there was no water. Somebody say no water. There was no water for the army nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Basically what he was saying is we are defeated. We are defeated. But look at what Jehoshaphat said. He said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And then Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. Someone say attitude. Attitude. The prophet there copped an attitude with the king of Israel because the king of Israel was serving other gods. He says, go to your gods. Come on, somebody. Go to your, go, 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 go to your psychiatrist. You know, go to the Kardashians. Come on, somebody. He says, but because of this, look at, he says, he says, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, verse 14, before whom I stand, surely if it were not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. He says, now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And look at what he said. This is the part I want you to see. He said, thus says the Lord. Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He said, he will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. 
and you shall, you shall win the victory according to this scripture. Look at verse 20. Now it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered that suddenly water came by way of Edom and the land was filled with water. Everyone say the land was filled with water. Everyone say the church was filled with water. Just for a moment, I want to talk to you on the subject of overcoming spiritual drought. Overcoming spiritual drought. You may be seated. What a, what a powerful story, especially when it says, and the land was filled with water. As I was praying this week, I just felt the Holy Spirit whisper in my ear the word drought. Everybody say drought. Now, living here in California, we understand this word very well because recently we just overcame and recovered from eight years of drought. Eight years of drought, which was equal to 376 weeks of insufficient rainfall. It was all over the news. We had to turn off our sprinklers on our grass. We had to time our showers. Come on, somebody. So in this 360 weeks of insufficient rainfall, we know living here in the state that everything became dry, brown, and thorny. And we know this is that where there is drought, things become dry. Fruit cannot grow. And life itself struggles to produce. Another thing you will notice is that when there's drought, even the varmints in the field begin to get stronger and more bold. And the field becomes filled with snakes and, you know, scorpions. I was in my backyard during the drought, and I found a snake, a scorpion, and a tarantula. Come on now. So how many know drought has an effect? Tell, na tell your neighbor, drought has an effect. There were four negative impacts of the California drought. Number one was energy. Everybody say energy. There was no energy. Energy was sapped. I remember we went to Yosemite that year, and it was during the time of the drought, and the river going through Yosemite, the Merced River, was literally totally dry. Pastor Chris and I, we literally stood in the center of that river, uh, and there was actually no water in the river. And, and what you got to understand is when the river doesn't flow, energy can't be produced. Flowing waters is what produces energy in, in the world. And so energy had to work harder. Many of you might even remember here in San Diego, we had blackouts. We had rolling blackouts. Who remembers that? We'd even be in a church service here, and then a rolling blackout would come through, and boom, everything would turn off and then turn on again. The state of California had to actually go outside of the state to buy energy from other states because there was no energy. The second impact of, of drought was that wildlife uh, was affected, where, where life could not be reproduced. Agriculture and farms were impacted. Farmlands could not produce the precious fruit that turned the economy of the state. Another tremendous impact of drought was wildfire. Now, how many know here in San Diego, we've know, been known to have some wildfires. We've had some heavy wildfires. And wildfire, uh, what I want to bring out here is the key word is wild. Just say wild, meaning out of control, meaning cannot be contained. You know, where there is drought, there's a certain desperation that sets in the hearts of people. When there's a drought, somehow people begin to act different. People begin to act strange. Maybe you've seen Christians like that, that at one time they were focused, but in a season of drought, they started to act funny. They started to act strange, started to act weird. Things begin to go what? Wild. Someone say wild. And then the fourth impact of drought is the loss of light. That when things become dry and when life can no longer be produced and when there is wild living and wildfire in the land. How many know it affects the lives of people? It brings chaos and confusion. These fires, when they broke out in San Diego, it destroyed a lot of buildings. It even destroyed a lot of lives and even took lives. But thanks be to God, 
that when you find yourself in a drought, God is able to send you fresh rain. Fresh rain. And when you look at the state of California now and you're driving through East Lake, the Chula Vista, you're driving by the beach, you're driving the mountains, how many know the flowers are blooming again? How many know the hills are no longer brown, but they're freshly green? Come on, somebody. And I came to tell you that the same way God pours out rain in the natural is the same way God wants to pour out rain in his church in the supernatural. Come on, somebody get excited that rain is coming. Elijah told, the, the, told King Ahab, he said, eat and drink, for I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And I said all that this morning to tell you that God is the God that is able to send fresh rain within your life. He's the God that could send fresh rain in your marriage. He's the God that could send fresh rain in your body. He's the God that could send fresh rain in your finances. Man, if you're doing ministry, God could send fresh rain into your ministry. God can take what's dead and bring it back to life again. And I think there's some people that can get excited because your prayer life is coming back to life. Your spirit is coming back to life. Your worship is coming back to life. Can I get anybody this, to, this evening to give him praise for that fresh rain? See, I think about this word, I, I, this word drought. I can tell you that I felt the Holy Spirit say that, that many of, of the churches face drought. Many of the churches face drought. When a church is serving God and battling for the Lord, there are times when drought will come. Tell your neighbor, drought will come. And, and, and understand me when I tell you that when, when there is no water, when there's no fresh water, people become thirsty for the wrong things. I can tell you, man, nights, I can tell you nights where I wake up and I need some water. Whoever gets up in the middle of the night, you need some water. And in my house, we have that air sparklets machine. And those bottles are heavy. Come on, somebody, those big bottles. And, and I get up in the middle of the night, and I'm too tired to go to the garage and get a new bottle. <laughs> and those bottles are heavy, and I don't want to go in the garage and get a new bottle. And I try to push, the, and there's no water. Someone say no water. So then I open up the fridge, and there's like half a soda. <laughs> but I'm so thirsty. Come on, somebody. I take that flat soda. I open it up and I drink it. And you know what's sad is that I'm even more thirsty after I drink it. And I want to tell you, we're dealing with a thirsty world. We're dealing with people when there's no water, they begin to drink the wrong things and it doesn't quench their thirst. But we've got a water, come on somebody. we got a water where they'll never thirst again. We've got a water that'll satisfy them. We've got a water that'll heal them. See, God will take what's dry and brown and cracked and he'll turn it green again. And his church today many times faces drought. They become malnourished. They become weak. Life can't reproduce. It even makes room for snakes and scorpions and wolves and sheep clothing. Come on, somebody. To come into the environment. Tell your neighbor, protect the house. And I want to speak about this for a minute because when the church is in a drought, worship is weak. Prayers are absent. Services are religious. Services are powerless, passionless, business as usual. One of the great preachers of our time, C.H. Spurgeon, he says, put fire in the sermon. But if there's no fire in the sermon, put the sermon in the fire. And I don't know about you, I determined in my heart that we're not going to become dry. We're going to seek out the Holy Ghost. We're going to worship God. We're going to invite fresh water and fresh rain and fresh wind and fresh fire. Is there anybody here tonight that says, yes, pastor, we've got to light ourselves on fire. We've got to open up the floodgates of heaven. There's no Pentecost in some churches. There's no open window. They come in and go out the same. They come in with, in, with hang-ups, and they leave out with the same hang-ups. They come in with addiction, walk out with the same addiction. They come in in bondage, and leave with the same bondage because there's no water. But here at Victory Outreach, we're building a river of water where people, when they walk in, they can't leave the same. They've got to be delivered. They've got to be transformed. They've got to. That's what this weekend's about. There's going to be powerful breakthrough in the lives of people. Someone say fresh water. When there's fresh water, your land will bloom, your cattle will reproduce, your life will be strong for the battle. 
And if you really believe the word of God to be true, your enemy will not be able to stand before you. Because God has called this church to create a church that is a river of power. A river of power. Now this story we read is a picture of the church. Every now and then you get into the Old Testament, you'll see, you read stories that are, are photographs of the New Testament church. And this, anytime you're dealing with God's people, you're dealing with the church. How many know we're God's people? And this story is a picture of the church. The enemy threatened Israel and Judah. And they came in alliance to defeat Moab. And as they were journeying to the battle, they come to a place that is dry, where there was no water to drink for their troops and their cattle. And so they found themselves in a drought. And what they actually needed was a miracle. They actually needed a miracle. Maybe you know someone in your family right now that they are in a drought. And the only thing that's going to change their life is a miracle is a miracle. So let's find out how they overcame the drought. The first thing they did is they sought out a man. They sought out a man. In verse 11, it said, but Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. Look at this. Who poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was a known man, a famous man, a famous prophet. And look what Jehoshaphat said. He, he said, the word of the Lord is with him. He's got the word. Say, neighbor, he's got the word. You've got the word tonight. <laughs> so as they came to this place of drought, the situation Understand, understand me when I tell you, didn't call for an ordinary man. An ordinary man could not change their season. An ordinary man could not heal their dry place. The situation didn't call for an ordinary man. The situation didn't call for a warrior. It didn't call for a strategist. It didn't call for a navigator. It didn't call for someone who was naturally strong. But they needed... An anointed man. Whew. I, I feel like I got to stop here and talk to some of our brothers in the house. I know you're strong physically, but you are you anointed. I know you've got muscles and you work in, in the workplace and you move boxes and you drive big cars and you do all kinds of construction and you run businesses. And I know you're even smart. But my question is, are you anointed? Because if the drought's going to come to an end, we need an anointed man. So you don't like me now. Brothers don't want to help me out. I know you're the man of the house, and you're the headline, and you're all that in a bag of chicken. I know you bring home the bacon, and I know you work 40 hours a week. But I got a question. Are you anointed by God? Is there a word in your spirit? Is there a word that God has given you to shift your season? Woo. Ladies, let me tell you, if you're going to date anybody, date an anointed man. Don't date a joker that's messing around with the world. Don't date somebody that's playing games in the house of God. You go find yourself an anointed man. You go find yourself a man with a word. You go find yourself a man that understands the power of God. Ooh, I'm preaching right now. Let me pull back a little bit. Ladies, let me pull back a little bit. Because the ladies have been praying. They tell me, Pastor, we need men of God. Pastor, we need spiritual warriors. We're tired of these fakes, frauds, and part-time broads. We need some men of God to rise up in the house of God. We need a real man. We need a real man of God. <laughs> Someone say, there's a man. And Jehoshaphat said, there's a man. <laughs> I said, fake part, part time. <laughs> Bring me back. <laughs> he said, there's a man. Someone said, there's a man who poured water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, there's a man who's functional in power. In other words, there's a man who understands the movement of the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, there's a man who prays. In other words, there's a man who has a relationship with God. In other words, there's a man who is familiar with miracles, who has seen miracles before. And in other words, there is a man who valued the anointing. See, Elisha served his master, Elijah, for seven or eight years. And in those seven or eight years, he witnessed the power of God as a disciple. And when it came time for his master to go home, Elijah looked at Elisha. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Any requests, I will grant for you. Do you want influence with the king? I got that. Do you, got, you want money? I got that. Do you want position? I got that. And Elisha said to him, I don't want any of that. I want a double portion of your anointing. I want a double portion of your anointing. And so... Elisha received a double portion. See, we need a generation in Victory Outreach that they're no longer praying to be popular. And they're not no longer praying for position. We need a generation in Victory Outreach that is praying for God to give them the power of the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. And I came to tell you that if you want to lead in this ministry, you must have power. You must have power because the ministry of Victory Outreach International is a miracle ministry. Today, there are people even here today that have had, if it had not been for the power of the Holy Ghost, you would have never got off drugs. There are people here tonight that if it had not been for the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost, your marriage would have never been healed. If it had not been for the power and the anointing of God, those yokes would have never been broken. But you are here because Victory Outreach is a power ministry. There is an anointing in this ministry. There are miracles in this ministry. We are treasures out of darkness. Hidden riches and secret places have been called by God. Somebody shout if you know that we are a miracle ministry. We've been birthed in power. We've been sustained through power. But now we're at a time where we need a new generation of power to rise up. I refuse to accept that there will ever be a power outage in Victory Outreach. But I'll tell you, my friends, I'll tell you, brothers, if you continue to walk in a spirit of drought, if you keep playing with the world, you keep messing around with the enemy, you keep compromising, you keep thinking that we can't see it. I came to tell you, we it's not that we can't see it. We can feel it. You don't got the anointing. You don't got the power. But we are in a season where God says, I'm going to throw out some fresh rain. I'm going to pour out some fresh water. Is there anyone here tonight says, I'm ready to drink, Pastor. I'm ready for a fresh anointing. I'm that man with the word. Woo. My God. Woo. Where are the Elishas? Where are the Elishas? Where are the ones that are hungry for the anointing? So the first thing to cure their drought is they sought a man. The second thing is they had to understand the mission. In verse 15 through 18, he says, now bring me a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. He said, thus says the Lord, look at this, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind and you shall not see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water so that you your cattle and your animals shall drink. He says, this is a very simple matter. <laughs> this is powerful. This is a very simple matter in the hands and the sight of the Lord. And also he will deliver Moab into your hands. What God was saying to them here is if you want water, you're going to have to dig. I was going to give this message a title, and the title I was going to give it was, It's Time to Dig. Or, You Dig? <laughs> but look at your favorite neighbor tonight and tell him, You're going to have to dig. Uh, woo. Here they are, 
they're going to war. They're going to war. They're, they're facing the enemy. They're under a threat of attack. They call on the prophet. Watch this. And instead of the prophet just calling down rain, because he could have did that. Elijah did that. He could have just called down rain, made it easy. But he tells them, if you want water, go out into the valley and dig. <laughs> Put down your sword and pick up a shovel. Put down your shield and your slingshot and your arrows and your bows and go to the shed in the backyard and grab yourself a shovel and get down into the valley and start digging. I think what the prophet was saying, because the prophet had an attitude. He told that guy, he says, I don't even want to look at you because you don't serve the Lord. He says, but because of Jehoshaphat, I'm going to do this miracle. But how bad do you want it? Because prophets get mad sometimes too. Prophets are people too. Tell your neighbor, prophets are people too. And he said, how bad do you want it? Do you really want water? Do you really want the victory? Do you really want your season to shift? Do you really want a miracle? Do you really want to see your family saved? Do you really want a healing? Do you really, I, I, you know, because I, I know you talk it, but are you ready to put your hands to the plow? I know you're always coming to church wanting a blessing, but are you willing to go in the shed and get a shovel and go down there and dig? Because if you dig, the water will show up. Someone say, preach it, Pastor. Here's what I've learned. Is that God uses unconventional methods to do impossible things. What is faith? Faith is obeying God even when it doesn't make sense. And sometimes faith is showing God how bad you want it. I came to tell you at San Diego that if you want to shift your season and you want to overcome your drought, Sometimes you're going to have to wrestle. Sometimes you're going to have to come to church and wrestle. Sometimes you're going to have to dig holes. Sometimes you're going to have to be like that woman who ran out of oil, and you're going to have to go to all your neighbors and look for pots. And you're going to have to knock on every door. Come on, somebody, and say, do you got a pot? 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 And the Bible says that she went out to her neighbors, and she got as many pots as she could. And then she went home with her little bit of oil, and she went behind the door and closed it, which represented her prayer closet. And she got all those pots, and she got that oil, and she began to pour it in the pot. And, and as she began to pour it in the pot, it would fill up. Then she would pour it, and then the pot would fill up. And then she would put it, and then the pot would fill up. And the Bible says when she ran out of pots, the anointing stopped flowing. So my question is, how bad do you want it? How much of God do you want? How much of an anointing do you want? How much of a breakthrough do you want? If anybody here today says, I'm ready for my season to shift, and I'm coming into the house of God with a new attitude, a new spirit of obedience, I'm saying, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. I'm willing to dig. I'm willing to wrestle. I'm willing to get pots, whatever you got to do. And, God, I'm going to give it to you. And as I give it to you, you're going to pour out a fresh water. You're going to pour out fresh anointing. Oh, give God a big, big praise, everybody. I think you caught it. See, someone say obey. We, we, we've got to learn to obey. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it doesn't make sense to do what the man of God is telling you to do or God is telling you to do. It doesn't make sense. But sometimes God is just looking for someone who recognizes that God uses unconventional methods to bring supernatural breakthrough. He never does it the way you think he's going to do it. Naaman needed a healing, and the prophet told him, go to the River Jordan. And Naaman said, listen, there are cleaner waters. There are cleaner waters. And then Elijah said, how bad do you want it? You going to listen to me or not? And he said, I'm going home. And then his servant, who was wise, came to him and said, listen, if he asks you to do something great, you were willing to give him money. You were willing to give him gold for your healing. You were willing to give him silver for your healing. And all he's asking you to do is go into a dirty river and to dip seven times and you shall be healed. If he asked you to do something great, wouldn't have you have done it? Why can't you do this little thing and just learn how to be obedient? And the Bible says Naaman went to the water. Come on, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. And he went to the water. He dipped once. He dipped twice. He dipped three times. He dipped four times, five times, six. On the seventh time, he came up 
clean. He came up healed. The miracle begins. Come on, somebody. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want revival? How bad do you want fresh water? How bad do you want fresh, fresh rain? So sometimes you got to do something that doesn't make sense. And, and, and God did this miracle, and this is where Jehoshaphat did what he was told. It set him up for the miracle that he experienced in 2 Chronicles 20, 20. He tells the people when the, when the Moabites again once tried to fight him, he tells them, obey the prophets and you shall be blessed. And so he takes all the musicians and he puts them on the front line. He didn't put the warriors. He put the musicians on the front lines, and the Bible says because he had seen it happen before. This is a good word, man, because if God did it before, God can do it again. And he put the musicians on the front line, and as they begin to worship the Lord, the confusion entered the enemy's camp, and they begin to kill each other. God is just looking for a church that will obey. God is just looking for a church that will dig. God is just looking for a people that will put down the sword and pick up the shovel. God is looking for somebody that will spend their time digging in prayer, spend their time digging in fasting, spend their time digging in worship. Come on, your body doesn't feel like worshiping, but you said, I'm going to dig today. I'm going to dig today. I'm going to dig today. I don't feel like clapping, but I'm going to dig today. I'm going to get my miracle. I'm going to pray today. I'm going to fast today. I'm going to serve today. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, you got to dig. And the more you dig, the more water you're going to get. You dig a little, you get a little. <laughs> I want to dig unlimited. To buy one of those automatic diggers. We're just digging all day long. Because the more you dig, the more you get. And you got to dig in prayer. You got to dig the ditches of prayer. You got to dig the ditches of worship. And you got to also dig the ditches of your gift. You know why there's no water? Because we don't use our gifts. God has given you a gift. Hey, neighbor, God's given you a gift. And you know how we're going to defeat the enemy? No. By you using your gift. Some of you are sitting on your gift. And that's why we can't win. You sing, but you're not up here. You play an instrument, but you're not over there in the pit worshiping. You want to run camera. You know how to run a camera. You work your phone. You don't want to serve in the camera ministry. You know how to run sound. You won't do it. You're a nice person, but you don't want to usher. You don't want to open up a group. You don't want to disciple nobody. You don't want to. See, you, you don't want me to get into your stuff now. You say, go back to the rain. I'm trying to show you how to get rain. I'm trying to show you how to overcome the enemy. You've got to dig. You've got to activate your gift. You've got to activate your talent. Come on, somebody. You've got to pull out your shovel, and you've got to say, God, the way that I'm going to defeat my devil is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pray, I'm going to worship, and I'm going to activate my gift. I've got the gift to preach. I've got the gift to sing. I've got the gift to evangelize. Someone said, you've got to dig. Because our gifts give us the ability to make war against the enemy. The, the final thing is the miracle. How do you overcome a, a drought? You, you need a man, you need, you need the right mission, and then you need to understand the miracle. Miracle number one was that as they dug, that's when water filled the valley. That's when they received what they needed. They received fresh water. As that, they dug and did what the prophet said. The water didn't come from the clouds or from the trees, or, but it came from the ditches. And it filled that valley where they had enough water to drink. How many feel like you're being refreshed already? Fresh water brought fresh strength, fresh power, their ability to fight. But then there was a second miracle, and the Bible tells us that the enemies were defeated. And he said, I'm going to give Moab into your hands. I'm going to do this thing to you. And so God delivered his people by their faith, by their obedience. And what happened was this, is that as the water started to fill those trenches, 
the enemy was gathered on the other side. And they looked down into the valley. And the Bible says that the sun shined on the water pool, on the trenches that were filled with water, and it looked like the valley was filled with blood. Now, there's a story behind it. If you study Israel and Judah, they were in a civil war, but they had come together to fight the enemy. And the Moabites looked down, and they saw that all the waters with the sun hit it, it looked like the valley was full of blood. So then the Moabites said to each other, oh, look, instead of fighting us, they fought each other. They killed each other. Moab to the spoil. Let's go down there. Let's just start stripping them of their jewels and their cattle. Let's go down and take the spoils of war. So their enemy mistook the water for blood. But guess what? Their enemy was not totally mistaken. Because the battle has already been won when Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. Come on, somebody. And I came to tell you that as we dig, we are building a church that is full of blood and water. We're building a church that is going to be full of blood and water. When Jesus was on the cross and they pierced his side, the Bible says water and blood came out of his side. Represent the water representing new life, representing cleansing, the blood representing the power of God to disarm the enemy. And I came to tell you, as you dig, God's going to bring up some water and he's going to bring up some blood. He's going to bring up some water and he's going to bring up some blood. He's going to cleanse you and he's going to disarm the enemy. He's going to cleanse you and he's going to disarm the attacks of the enemy. And I know some of you, the enemy has been attacking your mind. The enemy has been attacking your body. The enemy has been attacking your family. But I told you, when you get that shovel and you start digging, that valley's going to fill up with blood and water. And the enemy shall be defeated in the mighty name of Jesus. And I'm going to need you right now as they play it on the instruments. I'm going to need you right now to start praising him. I'm going to need you to start thanking him. In fact, right now, I'm going to need you to start digging for God. I'm going to need you to pull out that shovel. And I'm going to need you to say, I'm going down into the valley and I'm going to dig until I get my water. I'm going down into the valley and I'm going to dig until I, come on, play something on that instrument. Give me a musician so the power of God can begin. Come on, somebody speak in tongues. Somebody shout. Somebody start digging for the Lord. Come on, dig for the Lord right now. Come on, we got a couple minutes. Come on, dig for the Lord. Come on and dig. Blood and water. 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 Oh, woo. Hallelujah. Somebody say blood and water. This is a picture of the church. Someone say the church. It's a picture of the church. That as the pastors start digging, as the leaders start digging, as the people start digging, the drought is going to come to an end. But how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? And then blood and water are going to fill those trenches. The water representing the cleansing. The Bible says he will wash us with the water of his word. The Bible says the cross disarmed the enemy. Made foolishness of the enemy's power over your life. I came to tell you the enemy has been tormenting you too long. He's been beating you up too long. Someone said blood and water. But what you're going to have to do once you dig, you're going to have to learn to go down to that river yourself and stay in it. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you, you got to stay in it. Look at your other neighbor and tell him, you got to stay in it. There's this movie that impacted my life, and I've been wanting to share this. I'll just share it with you. It was starring Brad Pitt in the 90s. It's called River Runs Through It. 
And he had a brother, older brother, and their father was a preacher. It was like in the 30s. And their father was a fisherman, and he would take them out into the middle of that river in Montana, and they would fish for trout. And the father was very skilled, and they all became very skilled, and they got so skilled at it that the youngest brother, Brad Pitt, became the best. They would compare their fish at the end of the day, and Brad Pitt always had the biggest, beautiful trout. So he'd always wait to the end and say, check mine out. And they, oh, you become. One day his father tells him, you are a fine fisherman. He was very proud of him. But Brad Pitt had a problem. He was the youngest son, and his problem was that he liked to drink. His problem was that he liked to play cards. His problem is he liked fast women, and he liked the fast life. And when he got out of that river, he became a different man. As long as he was in the river with his dad and with his brother, he excelled. He was better than his dad. He was better than his brother. He had joy in his life. He was happy. He was victorious. He was having success and having results. But when he got out of that river, ooh, he became something different, just like some of you. And one day, his father got a phone call. Your son's been killed. He was killed in a bar fight. He was shot, dead. A great sadness swept over that home because there was a young man that as long as he was in the river, he was great. But when he got out of the river, he lost his favor. He lost his power. Blood and water. Stay in the river. Dig your ditch. Fill it up. Stay in the river. Lift up your hands all over this place. Make that commitment right now. I'm going to stay in the river. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to stay in the river. If this message spoke to you, I want you to come. If you're going to make a commitment to stay in the river, you're great in the river. But when you get out, you become a different man. You're great in the river, but when you get out, you become a different woman. Stay in the river. Get your shovel. Start digging. Start building your well. Blood and water. Build your well. Blood and water.